someone in the chat tell us who this is? This is Vel with an exclamation mark. Vel Phillips was had a career of first. She was the first black woman to graduate from UW Madison's law school, the first black and first female common council person in Milwaukee's common council. She went on to have a trailblazing career as a judge and until Mandela Barnes was elected in 2018. She was the only black person elected to statewide office as a secretary of state in the state of Wisconsin. So Vel, this remarkable human being, this is her at work. She took up the cause of open housing because she saw amongst her constituents people wanting to build general, generational wealth. And this is her trying to pass a bill for open housing and fair housing. Tell me a little bit, what, is it, what's, what do you read on Vel's face? What kind of emotional state do you think she's in? Somebody in the chat, tell me, okay, we got frustration. Are, are you kidding? kidding me? Exhaustion. Y'all don't get it. <laughs> right. You could keep going. Absolutely. Now her colleagues, take a look at her colleagues. There's a bunch of guys, this guy, this guy, this guy. Tell me what they're doing. This fella right here. Mm. We can't wait. We, we can yeah, wait her out. Yeah, they're good. bored, dismissive, not listening. You see everything from hostility to indifference, Rob, what do you think they're talking about in the back? These oh, those guys. guys in the back, they are planning their visit to the Eagles Club later. They heard Duke Ellington was in town. Have you heard of Duke <laughs> Ellington? He said Brooke drinks. <laughs> He's yeah, they're probably his drinking, race. <laughs> yeah, they're drinking scotch, smoking, talking about Duke Ellington. His, his big band is bully. So, Belle Phillips here looks alone. She's surrounded by hostility. A very frustrating life. This is actually... She was doing this for 10 years, bringing bills to the Common Council. Every time she brought it forward for a vote, she was defeated unanimously except for her vote. So this image is sort of symbolic of what Vil was, Vil was doing. She had people in the community who wanted to support her, but she was kind of on an island on her own. Bell did something which in retrospect is actually pretty radical, especially in the city of Milwaukee. She decided in this moment, after 10 years of struggle to get open housing passed, to reach out to the most hardcore smash mouth activists in the city. We do not see today politicians doing that very often. She reached out to these people and she said, you know what, Youth Council, I'm not gonna keep doing the same thing in City Hall. We have to, to get our law changed, our local movement will unify with you as the youth. So she reached out to the Youth Council and before we get to their marches, one last thing. I, this image is of a burning building. It's not the exact burning building I'm going to talk about, but it's just illustrative. In 1966, the Youth Council was stirring so much up that the local, a local chapter of the KKK bombed the headquarters of Milwaukee's NAACP. When they bombed the NAACP, the youth council went to the police and said, you have to protect us. And the police said, if you don't want trouble, don't make trouble for yourself. You know, so the folks, youth council- not, I'm gonna interrupt you briefly, Adam, I'm sorry. This is not Birmingham, Alabama, also referred to as Birmingham. You know, this is, this is not the deep south. This is in a city in the so-called north where we are going to now start to see images that we had often in the, the, the history, the way it's taught, often only associates this kind of racial violence with Southern locales. Thanks, Adam. And I just want to point out to Renee's point that she just made. Renee, um, this, so your cousin Wayne is holding the flag. The KKK who burned down the Freedom House, those people are probably still out there alive today too. So to accompany Rob's point there, not only is this not somewhere else, this is still us. Like these, these Marquette students that you see right here walking into the Eagles Club, those people are probably still out there somewhere. So the commandos were formed predominantly as a security unit. And the commandos, their charge was to protect the youth council. That was their job. And as the marches went on, they went from just being the muscle to being both the brains and the brawn. Many of the commandos had served in the military. 
They had served in uh, Vietnam. Uh, many of them worked in factories and lost their jobs in factories for being part of the commandos. And some of them had been involved in street life. There are gangs who literally squash their beef to take part in the commandos together. So, all right, we got all the pieces. Um, Rob, I'm just gonna say to you, we have three minutes left. Well, you know, the truth is folks, we, we have to continue because we've got to get our process together. So this is the first one. We're gonna run a little bit over. For those of you who have to jump out, we, yeah. we certainly understand. But Adam, we, we have to finish just so sure. that we have a complete product for folks. Right, so we're, we'll probably go another 10, 15 minutes, but this is the youth council. This is the law they wanted to change. You see the youth all over it. This is Milwaukee's local movement. And let me say this, to connect to another point Rob made, this is gonna end up being a long movement. So we are, the youth council, after picketing during the summer and actually seeing uh, the riots, which they had nothing to do with, they said Milwaukee needs marches. And on August 26, 1967, you can see here in the Milwaukee Courier, they announced their intentions to march to the South Side. At the time, the South Side was not just 100% white, it was 1,000% white. The white folks on the South Side were willing to fight to keep it white forever. And uh, we're gonna do a video here. So we are gonna see, uh, there's gonna be a few minutes of talking, and then we're gonna go into some footage that doesn't have sound, and I'll do a little narrating under it. A person's ownership of property is tied to many conditions. It is subject to deed restrictions, zoning laws, building and housing codes. I can say only one thing. Since I have every feeling this afternoon that this ordinance will be eventually defeated, you will have to face the issue of fair housing squarely and unequivocally. We march, we're going to march if they come out or if they stay in the house. We don't care. We're going to march. That's what's wrong. Everybody's been waiting, waiting. We're not going to wait. Well, Father, has your marches to the south side accomplished anything so far for fair housing? We're going to get fair housing not only for the city of Milwaukee, but we're going to get it on a national scene. And it's going to be this consistent type of, of courageous protest that's going to bring about fair housing legislation. Frederick Douglass talked about this 100 years ago. He said no one ever got their rights given to them on a platter. You've got to fight for it. You've got to struggle for it. And that's what we're doing. We're protesting. There are no longer excuses for inaction or delay. Those people who come every day to St. Boniface Church, and they come from all over the country, come there with the idea that nobody is free until everybody is free and we intend to march, all of us, until we get just some of the basic freedoms that are ours. If ever a matter, if ever a matter demanded the urgent attention and forthright action of this Common Council, this is it. Gentlemen, the time is now. Thank you. August 28th of 1967 is the first march. About 125 people started North Division High School at St. Boniface. They went down the 16th Street Viaduct, met by another 125. 250 protesters, this is a youth council, went across the 16th Street Viaduct and this is what happened. I'm gonna pause just for one second if I can. Nope, I'm not. So they were met by upwards of 8,000 angry white counter protesters. I've been told not to say angry white Southsiders because people came from all over the place to join them. They made it that night, they went down 16th Street, marched into that tidal wave of hatred, made it to Kosciuszko Park, went to a picnic area that they had the foresight to reserve, started saying a prayer and were kicked out by a park commissioner because they had it reserved for a picnic and not a prayer. Went back home that night. The second day, I don't know about you all, talk about audacity. They said, let's go back for a second day. There were 500 marchers the second day. 
This time they were met by as many as 13,000 angry white counter protesters yelling, throwing brick, bricks and rocks. There is a Confederate flag in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 1967. This is where Popeyes is today. People expressing outwardly hate, outwardly, those signs are professionally printed. I want to point that out. There was money in organizing behind the white counter protesters. There were people you're going to see here in a moment. They have on this car printed white power. That is a commitment. So another Confederate flag. Youth Council this time did not linger at Kosciuszko Park. They made it back home. And when they got to the 15th Street Freedom House, which was their headquarters, this is what they found. The police claimed that there had been a sniper on the roof. They shot a tear gas canister in and set the house on fire. The Freedom House burned. This is the next day. The mayor said there shall be no more marches. The youth council canceled their march officially, got together at the Freedom House. When they stepped off of the lawn and onto the sidewalk, the police declared them unlawful and arrested them. There were a bunch of people arrested that day. When the youth council said, you know what? If they're gonna arrest us just for rallying, we might as well march. And on the fourth day, they planned to march down to City Hall. They made it only a couple blocks before hundreds of youth council members, or hundreds, uh, over 100 people were arrested, included many children. I've heard stories from the marchers themselves saying the adults were really worried about the kids, but they could hear them down the hall singing songs in their cell. So they marched the next day and the next day in the face of, so, when the white counter protesters came out, the mayor was offered the services of the National Guard to contain them because they were out of control. It was a white riot. The mayor of Milwaukee, Mayor Meyer, said, no, it's fine. Many of the police officers were protecting the marchers from their own friends and family. That man in the white hat that you see is Dick Gregory. He's a comedian that joined up with the youth council. I think he had a, a cousin in the commandos and about a couple weeks in, he started joining the marches. There he is at the front. He also started strategizing with them as well. He was, uh, uh, you can see the Community Custard Center. That's where Tasty Twist is on Titonia today. Um, so Dick Gregory helped lead marches. And actually, they had their largest march of about 5,000, about two weeks into the marches. So they kept marching all over the city. You can see they marched on Lincoln. They marched on Mitchell Street. They marched on the north side. They marched out to Tosa. They marched all over the place. They marched every day in September, every day in October. They marched every day in November. And I'm actually gonna move now into some images. They marched, they said they're gonna march forever. Here are some images of them. This is them on the 16th Street Viaduct. You can see Marquette University in the background. You can see who the authors of this story are. Um, I want to tell you, the vast majority of the authors of this story, as you can see from this image, are young African-American people putting their life on the lines. They marched all over the place. They kept their spirits high. One of the questions I've returned to over and over to the youth council members that are still around today, I've said, how did you keep going? And they said that they had each other. A lot of them, really the family they had were the other protesters. The youth council became really a family. They relied on each other, they needed each other, and they fought with each other, but they kept it in the house. So I wanna point out, you can see here, a man with a gas mask on his head and a rifle marching somewhere down here on the south side. This looks a lot like him right here, maybe not exactly, but that is this, right after this one, this is the Freedom House burning down. Um, there's some incredibly dramatic, images here. This is a planning meeting of the commandos. You can see, I would say, you know, sometimes, a lot of times the story gets consolidated to Father Grappi. I think he would have a strong distaste and be spinning in his grave if he knew he had oftentimes been isolated as the figurehead of the movement because so many other people were involved in it. The commandos here, you can see most of the seats at the table here are occupied by the commandos. As the marches went on, Father Grappi was tugged into other national kind of conversations. Back home, the commandos held it down. Um, actually, this is Rob. Do you want to talk about this image for? Yeah, a minute? this is this is of all the images, and I, I again, we, we're encouraging uh, folks to give our students the opportunity to do these image analyses. I know that you all have a number of these kinds of uh, lessons and rubrics in, in in place already, but this image to me, uh, it 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 embraces the tension 
of the moment. It, it visually sort of gives us uh, some impending uh, crises that are emerging. You see the, the stance of the NAACP Youth Councils, the young men trying to uh, maintain control of their own uh, sort of physical uh, expressions, what, what, at the same time being certainly fearful of what might happen. And then you have on the other side, um, a group of what we assume to be police officers uh, about to sort of close in uh, on those young people in, in that space. I tell you that this, this, this image is, is a great example of how space teaches us or informs that is just none but space and opportunity and you can feel all the tension right there this is this is my favorite photo it, it tells us so much about the moment thank and you even, i mean to draw some points here to the current moment we see armed protesters around the country taking over capitol buildings white men with assault rifles and then you see people freaking out about colin kaepernick taking a knee or mike brown being presumed to be armed and dangerous solely by being a person so I think um, this image is, is one that resonates really, really strongly with, with the current moment. Well, um, and, it, and it also is, a, is a, again, sort of the, uh, a great example of how the theories and the ideas around protests had expanded into communities mm -hmm. beyond the South. Obviously, they are practitioners of nonviolence, while at the same time being very willing to protect themselves as needed. Absolutely. You know? I think, yeah. So um, this is the counter protesters. This street right here, you can see Forest Home Beer and Liquor Store. This is where uh, today the intersection of Cesar Chavez Drive and Forest Home, I believe. So these, um, this is a point I've heard Rob make many times. You know, these young men look like students and this looks like the teacher. And that, that is literally true in this case you have a youth movement of hate as well as a youth movement of the NAACP Youth Council. I think it's important. One of the reasons I think this story has been lost is that this is a difficult story for white people to hear because all of us want to identify with the people on the right side of this thing. But these people, much like many of the youth council um, members and commandos are still around, these signs are in someone's garage somewhere. These guys are somewhere. They have children and grandchildren. And they probably don't show them these images, but they teach them these lessons. Um, this is who they're protesting against. This is, this is the response to this. So you have, well, there's a lot of images out there, some really beautiful ones of these movements, of this movement. And really a lot of these images I had not seen until the last few years. Um, really incredible images of dramatic civil rights movement in Milwaukee. On the day that the Packers played, I actually saw in December, the marchers organized a uh, boycott of businesses hostile to African Americans. They called it Black, Black Christmas. They had their own Black Santa. Um, then on the day that the Packers played in the famous Ice Bowl football game, the youth council was outside marching probably for longer than the football game and burning a few more calories and wearing fur, looking like Joe Namath. Um, this is a um, telegram from the uh from Mar the reverend dr martin luther king jr to father grappi to show his support of the marches overall the youth council commandos father grappi vel phillips they marched for 200 consecutive days they eventually disbanded the marches because vel's bill was making no more progress in the common council in the city of milwaukee they decided to join martin luther king's poor people's campaign martin luther king was a huge admirer of what was happening in milwaukee and then only a couple weeks later, actually like barely two weeks later, Martin Luther King was shot and killed. There were responses around the country, some of which were violent, some of which were nonviolent. Milwaukee, this is the response in Milwaukee. Milwaukee saw one of the largest nonviolent responses because Milwaukee had gotten really good at marching. This is one image that people might have seen before. This is another. This is about 15,000 people. Uh, from the perspective of rhetoric, but also just from the reality of it, 15,000, this was a, a showing of strength in Milwaukee that was larger than the, sh the largest showing of hatred. There were 13,000 counter protesters on the second day. This is Milwaukee saying, here's who we are. I would uh, encourage you again to underscore the point, this was an integrated movement. 
But the people that put their lives on the line in the movement, oftentimes you see here a lot of young African-American people. Where are those folks, where is this uh, picture taken, folks? Name the location. Someone in the chat, tell us where this is. You know where it is. You can tell, this is Milwaukee. It's somewhere in Milwaukee, right? <laughs> Give me that hint. <laughs> Like, where does this look like? It still looks That's like right. that. That's right, Wisconsin yes. Ave, absolutely. So here is where the Riverside Theater is. This is where that subway is. This is um, like Planet Fitness is right here. Grand Avenue Mall right here. Yeah, so this is right downtown. And I mean, this is a point. Uh, this image showing, this is just a phenomenal image. One of the most inspiring images in the history of the city of Milwaukee. There's no, there's no marker to say this happened. There are people that stand in line here to go see uh, David Blaine or something, or you know, go see Hootie and the Blowfish, but they have no idea that they're standing where history happened. And this specific history, not the history of a duck, dirty is fine, but what is the history? This history isn't what we memorialize. So um, Milwaukee saw this incredible um, action. And then after, after uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Washington, D.C., in Congress, they discussed Bell Phillips, they discussed the Youth Council, they discussed Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they then incorporated Milwaukee's movement into the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which is called the Fair Housing Act. So, in effect, the Youth Council won, and then shortly after, Mayor Meyer, um, after the, the, the Common Council passed Bell's bill, signed her bill into law, which is more stringent. So talk about a long freedom struggle 200 days of marching, finally get their bill passed, then even longer of a struggle because those are infamous laws because of how, how resilient racism and hatred is, how resilient prejudice is. They're very, very difficult to, pass, uh, to enforce. But in effect, the Youth Council from Milwaukee, Wisconsin changed. They achieved their goal. The law was changed in our local movement. Those young people got fair housing legislation for the whole country. This, we're going to move through some of these real quick, just as a, as a coda. Shortly thereafter, so the Youth Council and Commandos moved on to other campaigns. So did Father Grappi, so did Vell. This is the Chapman Hall takeover at UW-Milwaukee, which happened in the early 70s, when Latino students, when Mexican students went to the chancellor and said, you know what, there's no faculty, there's no programs, there's no books, there's no courses that reflect our culture. The chancellor said the same thing the MPD said and said, get out of my office. And they ended up getting out of his office for a minute. One day they snuck into his office, called their friends from his phone, and they took it over. So the Latino students at UW-Milwaukee ended up occupying the chancellor's office. They were really excited. Um, this is them looking for Spanish language texts in Goldmeyer Library, not finding any, very clever. This is them celebrating victory. Um, I can see Nick and Rob making fun of my David Blaine and Hootie references. And those were on purpose, guys. I was trying to name things that were. So, um, and that was actually, so Nick, this is your dad? Not surprised. So, um, yeah. So again, I mean, these, are, these aren't just some vestiges of the past. That's like, this is Milwaukee. Like people are still around. The children of these, these movements are still here. In some, some cases they are. This is uh, Gabrielle Rivero's made this illustration for the Long March to Freedom, which is a publication Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service made in collaboration with Curdo. Um, you know, just showing that this, these images still resonate. And then we wanted to put on here, um, so, and people ask the question, um, were those the largest marches, were they the largest protests in the history of Milwaukee and Wisconsin? Actually, in last last handful of years, you have Act 10, you have the huge protests, that Voces and others, the Days Without, uh, Days Without Latinos, um, that have been organized, some huge protests in Milwaukee. In, so the, the, the bridge there is that, you know, the Youth Council started this marching thing 50 years ago, and there are people in, in our own community who are still doing that to this day. 